To be honest, in practice, usually you must mix spaces because usually you do not have variables that are all functionings or all uh, resources. So often there's a mixture. But even despite that, um, it's a good practice to try to think about the space and to convert, when, when possible, the measures into being consonant with each other. For example, if you are trying to measure in the space of capabilities, but you have some resources, you can try to think how to treat the resources so that they are the best possible proxy of um, general purpose resources for functionings that you might have. The unit of identification and analysis is a very important decision. And that's a fundamental and early decision that you will make. Um, we, in terms of the English terminology, we call the unit of identification the row in the matrix that you identify as poor or not. And the unit of analysis, the denominator when you create um, your poverty statistic and particularly the headcount ratio. So the unit of identification could be a person or a household, an institution or a geographic region. The most common are people or households. But the unit of analysis, even if you use the household as a unit of identification, as we do in the global MPI, you may use as the unit of analysis the person, in which case you report the headcount ratio as the percentage of people rather than the percentage of households. On the unit of analysis, this is a topic on which we have a strong preference for using the person rather than the household as the unit of analysis, reporting the headcount ratio in terms of the population. And the reason for this is that poor people often live in larger households. And so using the household as a unit of analysis may underestimate um, poverty. But the unit of identification really um, should be chosen depending on your purpose. And there are justifications for using both. And we ourselves and our colleagues have done measures using various units of identification. So first of all, you could choose the person and identify every person as poor or non-poor. If you do that, there are certain benefits. For example, you can decompose your measure by gender and have meaningful results. With the global MPI, we can decompose by gender, but actually the results are not meaningful because the household is the unit of identification. So the disaggregation simply reflects the percentage of people who are one gender or another in poor households. You can also look at age-specific characteristics of poverty. We do decompose the global MPI by age, but it's the same definition for different age groups. And you may want to know specifically which age groups are poorer than others. If you have a data set that has information on different members of the same household, then you can also um, look at intra-household inequality. Are women poorer than men? men poorer than women, children poorer than their families. So for example, Mexico's official multidimensional poverty measure takes the person as the unit of identification. And they can therefore report that women are poorer than men in Mexico. Bhutan's gross national happiness index takes the person as the unit of identification. Work that I did with Maurizio Apoblaza using the EU silk data in 31 European countries takes the person as the unit of identification. And in none of those 31 countries were women less poor than men. And parity was only, seemed to have been achieved in Portugal, which was, according to some measures, the poorest country. So there is a, an advantage. There are some disadvantages. It is sometimes difficult to include all people for example, babies. What do you do about education for babies? Or work, employment for babies? Um, the health needs of babies are different. 
And so, for example, Mexico is a measure of adults, and they don't capture child poverty in their national MPI at all. Um, on the other hand, you could do an individual measure for children and have different indicators for different cohorts, for people ages 0 to 2, 3 to 5, 6 to 14, and 15 to 17. Um, and I, if we have time to present some work on child poverty later, Anavaj and I can present a little bit of that structure. Even if you use the person as the unit of identification, some variables are likely to come from the household. Water, sanitation, electricity, household, and often income. Often the surveys do not have gendered or individual income, so that will be pooled. But what you will do in that case is give each person their household level variable, but still retain the person to identify who is poor. The, another, the next option, which is the one used in the global MPI, is to take the household as the unit of identification. This is the most common in national MPIs, partly because multi-topic household surveys are the most common source of information. And they have individual level data for education and maybe for health, maybe for employment. But they have household level data for other topics and they often have specific child modules. And so you can capture children also. In the case of household level identification, you might think it is easy. But if you have individual level data on education for every household member, then you must realize you have to combine all of the household members' information into a deprivation or a non-deprivation for that household and thinking of how to combine individual data into a household indicator um, is something we will need to talk about because it's not done in income poverty measures to the same extent. There are, as I said, most national governments use household as a me measure of identification. And the reason was well put by the government of Colombia, who said, look, we take this as an ethical position that we are wanting households to care for each other and to share their benefits. And we want to strengthen the unit of the family or the household as the local unit of benefits. Um, and their government services are provided to households. And they were concerned that if they identified some people in the household as poor and not others, then that might lead to providing differential benefits and create tensions within households or lack of a sense of responsibility for other household members sharing. So there, there were certain substantive reasons to justify that as a unit of identification. I mentioned child poverty measures, but you could also think of individual measures with um, factory workers of textiles, with stay-at-home mothers, uh, um, with children, youth, elderly, um, different population groups. So you can do individual level measures or group level measures for these special populations. So at this point in time, nearly all MPIs take either the person or the household as the unit of identification. But it is not necessary to do so, and so I wanted to present some other options. One would be to take the institution as the unit of identification. I gave an example this morning about taking the school as the unit of identification and having different indicators of the school as indicators in the MPI, columns in the matrix. Sometimes you don't have household survey data down to local levels and you don't have census data that include MPI variables. And so you may want to combine data sources. And so in that case, you could take a municipality, a district, a data zone as the unit of identification. What I must signal is that in the case of institutions or um, regions, taking them as the unit has implications for the rest of the steps of the measure. For example, in a municipality, if your MPI includes malnutrition, what is your deprivation cutoff? 
what you will have at the municipality level might be what percentage of children are malnourished. And you may need to distinguish across municipalities how much malnutrition is too much. And so your deprivation cutoff changes in nature. Also, for a municipality level measure, you might combine different surveys that are representative to it, but they might have different sample designs and so different errors for each indicator. You might combine that with administrative data or with satellite data. And when you combine data sources, generating the confidence intervals becomes much more complex. So you have to understand very carefully all of the data sources and their aggregation. So 90% of the measures will use the person or the household, but I mention these others because they might be relevant to your work in the future. Any questions on space or unit of identification? Yep. Yes, so if you are using a municipality measure and you have microdata for all of the individuals in that municipality, but you have to merge it with another survey that's representative, then you cannot use individual level cutoffs. So you lose all of the inequality within that region and every person in that region is coded as deprived or non-deprived. That's why we don't use it much, is that it's much cruder. It can be appropriate when poverty is spatially defined. So um, when there are certain data zones where everybody is poor and others that are less con highly concentrated, then a, 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 this kind of an approach may work. Um, but where there are rich people and poor people living together, it will be much, much less revealing. Yep. So um, the weight would be, so if you have an individual, then you use the individual level sampling weights. If you have a household, then you may use the individual sampling weights to weight up. But what do you do if you look at 100 schools? One option, one school, one vote. You weight all of the schools equally. Another is that you weight them by the number of children. And that, to me, seems a more sensible approach, um, that you would weight the schools by the number of people, the municipalities by their population, so that your aggregate, you could say, for the children in our country, for the, the people in, in our country, these are the levels of poverty. So the headcount ratio in that sense would be the percentage of children attending schools that are low quality. Um, it would not be the percentage of schools that are low quality. Yep. Uh, for reason of analysis, uh, can you take the, the national coverage of our region as uh, for each variable class to be made uh, So take the median as the cutoff. So think about that over time. If you're making a measure that you will compare over time, then the median will change. So basically you're using a relative poverty line. In that case, you use, lose the properties of focus, deprivation and poverty focus. But also you have difficulty comparing. So one option would be to, in year one, look at the median and use the median or a fraction of the median as a cutoff, but define it in absolute terms. And then apply the same absolute cutoff in subsequent waves. That will make your comparisons easier to interpret. Yeah? I was asking here for uh, something like uh, whether we can compare uh, some programs, uh, some programs, uh, some control, uh, control group and some other groups, whether we can apply the NPI in this way, like the schools, few schools are evaluated in one, for one program and we are trying to see those two ways if possible. Yes, it is. We'll have a session later on impact evaluation that Anavaj will take. But um, 
So some impact evaluation things would happen at the individual level and some at, the ins at all children attending a school or something else. And so you will have to consider that in setting up um, the evaluation. Um, she, her work so far has focused on like oportunidades in Mexico where it's, it's at the level of the household, um, the, the intervention. But if it was differently defined, then you could think of that. What are the outcomes that were anticipated for the school and did they change in that direction differently than the control group? Okay, so um, I'll move on now to the choice of dimensions. I begin with this quote that mentions weights because all of our choices from now on, the choice of dimensions and the choice of indicators, affects the choice of weights. All of these three choices are interconnected. And so although I'm going to present it in a linear format, one, you make one decision and then another and another, in practice, you tend to make them together, go back and forth between them. Um, and Sen is very clear that when you select capabilities for measurement, again, you will leave some out. And that selection and that leaving out is not a cause for consternation or embarrassment. It's simply part of the measurement exercise. Just like, you know, you're not going to include everything in your consumption list because the survey would get too long. So, first of all, this is very important. Let me clarify how I am using the terms. I am using the term dimension like we use it in the global MPI to talk about categories of indicators. So in the global MPI, we have health, education, and living standard. Do those appear in the matrix? No, they are conceptual, they're groupings. What appears in the matrix are the indicators. So the dimensions are conceptual categorizations. I mention them because usually dimensions are equally weighted as they were in the case of the global MPI. So they affect the weights on the indicators, although they themselves are invisible. They don't exist in empirical terms. By indicators, I will mean the columns of the matrix, right? The actual data that you work on. I want to clarify this because in the paper with James Foster, we use the word dimensions for the columns in the matrix. And I don't want you to get confused. So don't read that paper. <laughs> or if you do, then don't get confused because the words are used differently. We realized later after we wrote the paper that it will be too confusing in empirical work. So we used these two terms, dimensions and indicators. So, a moment to wake up. Um, can you just quickly scratch on a piece of paper, if you've done work on poverty, or if you are thinking about doing work on poverty, a couple dimensions, a couple indicators, and a couple deprivation cutoffs, just so that when I talk these through a little bit more, it makes sense. So it's just to get the idea that we're now in a, in a space of flexibility um, where you can create the things that are going to reflect poverty in your context and they will vary a lot. So how do we choose the dimensions, these conceptual first steps? Clearly, if you are required to use existing data, you will be limited by the variables that are in your data set. And you may not be able to include, for example, violence, because it may not be in the data set, or empowerment, or other variables. Also, you may wish to consider participation. One option is to read participatory studies in your country that have been completed. Another option is to undertake participatory work yourself, um, extensively or briefly. A third is there may be some document or framework of consensus. It might be a national plan. It might be the Sustainable Development Goals. It might be a human rights charter, a constitution, um, or something else that would basically reflect a consensus that these are the important items 
um, for poverty measures to continue. And then there may be more philosophical, theoretical reasons. Um, Martha Nussbaum has 10 central human capabilities. Um, some groups have an idea of what poverty is. And so theories very rarely come into poverty measures, actually, much more rarely in practice than I thought they would. Um, but they are, in theory, possible. Um, one example of a theory, more for a well-being measure, is the Islamic Development Bank is interested in this idea of maqasad al-sharia. Um, and there are five dimensions of this well-being concept. And so measuring well-being in a way that really resonates with this articulation of well-being, maqasad al-sharia, could be a, a deep benefit because it means that the measure could be accepted and could have a resonance um, with different people. Um, so that's um, the first. In terms of participation, um, we always think of doing new participatory studies. And it's certainly right to do them, partly so that people feel they had a say, feel that they gave their input, even if their answers are not so different. But on the other hand, we don't want to waste poor people's time, and sometimes we don't have money. And so reading existing participatory studies can be another way of getting information to put into the poverty measure. So the Voices of the Poor Studies, for example, three volumes are online, full text, and cover 60 countries. And they are not nationally representative, but they have some qualitative work um, with some groups in each of the countries. So it's a source to consider. And there might be other sources done by NGOs, um, done in the preparation for the SDGs um, that you might want to look at as a way, in that sense, within one week, reading the chapter, reading some other things, you can have an idea of what has come up in terms of poverty from different groups. Another option, if there is not the money to do direct participatory work, is to involve representatives of faith-based groups, of NGOs, of civil society, labor unions, whatever are the active groups. Um, sometimes they're athletic associations, local housing associations. But these representatives might be able to speak on behalf of their communities. Um, and that kind of more consultative set of meetings has been done in many places. But just so that you get an idea, and this doesn't sound too terrifying, I'd like to show you the results of some of these. So, for example, the Voices of the Poor study um, came up with a synthetic list of well-being and ill-being, which they drew on, which they drew together from all of these participatory studies. So here is what they came up with, that the dimensions of well-being are having enough food, assets, and work, being healthy, being able to use lipstick. Um, I mean, come on. You know, we, we're, we're people beyond just um, physical machines. Having a nice physical environment for your home, for your work. Social well-being, being able to take care of your children, um, be respected in your community, and have self-respect and dignity. And then I mentioned that violence was one of the surprises, but it came up so often. People wanted a safe environment. They wanted personal security. Um, they wanted there to be respect for the law. And then as they move towards old age and cannot work anymore, um, if their children have left or if um, they're not good relations in the family, they would like some kind of security of a more economic and health-related sort. And another surprise was how prominent psychological well-being was in descriptions of um, well-being, which included peace of mind, happiness, and harmony, including harmony with a greater than human source of meaning and value. And then this idea of empowerment did come up. People wanted to be free to choose, free to act, feeling really that they were independent. If we look at the Sarkozy Commission, the Stiglitz and Fitusi Commission that I mentioned earlier, they focused also on well-being. And they came up with eight dimensions that they argued should be considered by any measure of well-being. 
We are focusing on poverty, which is a subset of well-being. But I wanted to show you their dimensions because they are wider than what we will use. But what we will use will not perhaps be wider than this. So they also included material living standards, health and education, work, but also other personal activities that could be volunteerism, it could be the, the work of raising children, the work of keeping your house clean, cooking, those kinds of things. Political voice and governance, social connections, relationships, love and family, the environment, and both economic and physical security. So um, I'm going to put some slides in the presentation that have lists. Um, just because I think what's reassuring to me is when we look at very, very different lists from different sources, um, each of which have been drawn up independently of each other, we find a lot of similarity. And so if you are trying to design a measure, you could start by looking at these lists and then thinking, well, which of them do I want? But at least you might remember something that you would have overlooked and you also might have confidence that others have also found this dimension to be interesting. So I sh early showed you the Voices of the Poor well-being dimensions. This slide shows you 10 dimensions of ill-being according to Voices of the Poor. The My World survey, we looked at the first day with 10 million people. Um, those are its top 10 dimensions. Um, we looked at measures of multidimensional poverty. Those are synthesized in the next column, the sustainable development goals, and a philosophical treatment of clustered or multidimensional disadvantage. So whether it's philosophy, internet surveys, uh, poor people participatory work, they're quite similar. So in the dark lines, I group together indicators or topics that are really quite similar. So most of them had something on health and food, most of them something on work, something on education, something on water, sanit sanitation, energy, something on physical violence. Some of them had work on empowerment. Some of them had special focuses, whether it was gender, child conditions, inequality. And then a few of them had governance, institutions, or the environment. So again, that gives you a a starting point to consider. And here are some other lists, just so that you see. This is a Chilean philosopher and activist, Manfred Maxneef. This is a cross-cultural psychologist working to understand um, universal human values. Robert Cummins is a social scientist in Australia looking at life satisfaction and its different domains. Maureen Ramsey has worked on human needs Doyle and Goff worked on basic needs. Um, John Rawls in political liberalism, a, a philo uh, political philosopher. Johann Galton was responsible for the rise of human rights in the United Nations. Alarch drew up the first um, comparable w social welfare study in the Scandinavian countries, looking at having, loving, and being. Andrews and Withy were very prominent in developing social indicators in the United States. Laswell is a jurisprudence person. Diener and Biswas are again looking at subjective well-being. And Muzaffar Kizilbash was synthesizing philosophical approaches. So I wanted you to get the sense that there are resources to draw on as you think about dimensions. And they're not too different. The final resource is existing national MPIs. So on this slide, I have the countries that have released official national MPIs. I hope I got them all and the dimensions that they include. And what you see is that everybody includes education. El Salvador adds early childhood education and child care. Everybody includes something on health, though it's differently defined, something on standard of living and housing. So those four dimensions are present in some way in most living standard, or in most MPIs, except that Pakistan does not have um, work. So usually when you justify your dimensions in the methodological report, in your presentation to the ministers or to civil society, you'll justify it in several ways. 
you'll say there was a participatory exercise and this is what came out of it. We had these variables in our data set. This also resonates with our national plan. You don't have to choose one, but you can try to use several different kinds of justifications to explain your dimensions that structure your measure. So I mentioned that there's an interconnection between dimensions, indicators, and weights. And that's not my idea. That idea came from Sir Tony Atkinson. Um, in 2002, he edited a book with Eric Marlier, um, sorry, wrote a book with Eric Marlier um, for Europe on social indicators. And they observed that the interpretation of a set of indicators is much easier if the individual indicators have weights, degrees of importance, that are roughly equal, not very different. So this was in the context of Europe, which was moving to develop national poverty plans and social, basically a set of social indicators that the European nations would agree to report and analyze regularly that addressed social exclusion, which is in a sense their term for non-monetary aspects of poverty. And they realized that given their objective of communicating to policymakers, um, if they had indicators that were very different in importance, like the example I gave yesterday of malnutrition or long fingernails, um, then it would be very difficult for policymakers to absorb. And so he recommended a balanced set. And that will also probably be recommended in the Atkinson Commission report. So um, when you write up your dimensions for your methodological report, I put here what, how Ingrid Robbins suggests that you write them up. She first of all suggests that you go through the dimensions one by one and justify them, as I said, by participatory work, the national plan, whatever. Um, um, and if you have a methodology, if there was an expert group participatory work that you mentioned that. But she also suggests that you name explicitly dimensions you wanted to include but could not, usually because of data limitations. So for example, when we made the global MPI, we wanted to include work, and we wanted to include empowerment and violence, but we didn't have the data. And so explicitly saying that is useful, because then when somebody says, why didn't you measure empowerment, you can say, well, we wanted to, but we didn't have the data. It also, she observes, means that if we do this as a community over time, that we will be educating people who read our papers about the data needs for the future. And we hope that we can change what goes into household surveys in the future. So let me just close this with some examples. Colombia's measure has five dimensions and 15 indicators. So it has education. It has a dimension on childhood and youth where they gather together the different child-related indicators. Um, and then it has work, informal work, health, and housing and public services. Mexico has six social rights plus income. And it's quite interesting that whereas in Colombia, the dimensions emerged from their national development plan, in Mexico, um, they are named in the general law of social development. Um, the general law of social development actually names seven dimensions. The seventh is co social cohesion, but Mexico couldn't include that in the MPI, so reports it separately. So in both of these contexts, they didn't necessarily use participatory work to justify it. They used a document or a law. So um, just to summarize, the dimensions are conceptual categories. It may seem daunting to look at them, but if you look at the lists of dimensions that have come up for poverty and well-being, you'll get an idea that there's a lot of similarity. If you look at those that have been implemented in national MPIs, they're also similar. It does not mean there's not room for Im improvement and innovation, but it means that you do have a set of resources to start from as you uh, choose your dimensions. And the only request is after you choose them that you justify them using as many sources as you can
to explain to people the different converging sources of information um, that you drew on. So we are now through four of those eight normative choices. I'm going to have to speed up. Um, the choice of indicators is actually going to be quite quick. And the reason is that most of the choice, a lot of the choice of indicators does come from the statistical techniques that we will treat in a separate session on its own. Um, but there are some more conceptual or normative criteria that I wanted just to introduce. For example, when I was working in Bhutan, both to make their national MPI and their national gross happiness index, we went through the questionnaire and next to every indicator we wrote down was it a stock or flow indicator? Was it um, input, output, or outcome? Was it subjective or objective? And actually getting those categories very clear in your mind when you're looking at the survey data is quite useful because you might say in selecting indicators, I would like to give priority to flow indicators because a stock indicator will not change. What is a stock indicator? I used one in the EU Silk European measure that I built because for data reasons I couldn't do anything else, but I think that it was a bad indicator. For adults, I used whether or not they had completed lower secondary school. Now that completion of lower secondary school will not change for the rest of their life. There's no way that policy can change it. And that was important because it contributed the most to poverty in many of the poorest countries. But the, it is a stock variable. Even if you give adult learning, technical courses, vocational education, lower secondary school completion will not change. So these are the kind of indicators we want to avoid. We want to give indicators that create incentives to policymakers. And those are indicators that show change when positive change happens. And then you also might want to say, look, I would like to give preference to outcome indicators or to objective indicators or to some other category. But I think being very clear in your mind what kind of data uh, each question contains is a very useful step alongside the technical work. Atkinson and Marlier also suggest the following six considerations for poverty indicators in particular. Clearly they have to resonate with poor people's ideas. Clearly they need to be policy relevant. Um, and perhaps reflect the institutions. And what he means there is if there is a particular benefit package that should reach people with disabilities, then make sure that the name of that benefit package is in the survey, that that's what you are tracking. But there's a fourth point that is often overlooked. They can be interpreted. Let me give an example of an indicator that is very difficult to interpret, and it's access to health care. You might say, um, how often did you visit the doctor last year? And I might say 10 times, and that's a lot. You look at the distribution, I have went to the doctor a lot. And you say to me, you must be very rich because you had all the money to go and visit the doctor. So you're not poor in health. Or you might say you're very poor because you were sick so you went and got treatment. But then the person who was too poor to get treatment would not be health deprived in health. So a variable like that, it seems very intuitive, but it's actually not. The one you mentioned is better. You know, were you ill, but didn't have the ability to attract medical con um, uh, attention? Then that's, a, that, that's easy to interpret. If they were ill and couldn't, that's a deprivation. If they weren't ill, it's less of a deprivation, though you're not sure if they could have, if they wanted to. Um, if they were ill and went to medical care, you know it's a non-deprivation. So it's better, though not perfect. Um, we think when we look at data that we would be able to interpret everything. But when you sit down and really think it through, and today is about thinking, not computing, then some of them are more difficult. And then bearing in mind the survey costs is important. If you are working in statistical offices, you may or may not be also implementing surveys. 
And so you may not know um, how expensive it is, for example, to get anthropometric data on malnutrition. The extra training enumerators require, they have to travel with measure sticks and weights. Um, they have to find all the children to weigh. So knowing a little bit about which questions are very quick, one minute, three minutes, which questions take 20 minutes, is actually very useful um, when you are proposing survey changes. So these are a few things that we won't discuss when we think of indicators technically, but that they are important. And the final thing is, it's, it's less normative, um, but I wanted to bring it up, um, which is some considerations about which indicators really will reflect people's deprivations over the past year. So a very common example is that if you ask somebody if they were ill and had to go to a doctor, you often use two weeks, 15 days, as your recall period. And the reason is people can answer very quickly. They can answer easily, their answers are accurate. And as we saw in consumption surveys, asking about the last seven days is much more accurate than asking about the last 30. But if you think about an MPI, what you are then doing is taking those last two weeks and saying that the person's health in those last two weeks reflects their health in the last 52 weeks, if the survey is every year, or the last 104 weeks, if the survey is every two years. And so there's a tension, because to get good quality survey data, we want a short reference period. But sometimes for the MPI, we want a longer reference period. Um, Also, there are some events or some situations in which an indicator might seem very sensible but actually um, not be very appropriate. And I'll give an example of immunization. Who is against child immunization? All of us are for it. When does a baby get immunized? Between zero and two. What percentage of households have a baby between zero and two in their household? How many of them are at the age in which they should have completed most of the immunizations? It's just a fraction. And therefore, if you put immunization into an MPI, you might have 95% of the households be non-deprived because they don't have a baby. And of those who have a baby, immunization is usually 70% or above, often 90% above. So of the households with a baby, 10%, 20% will be deprived. So if that's the case and you put it into an MPI, maybe 10% of 5%, so a very, very small proportion of households will be deprived in immunization. So effectively, it will have a very light weight. So there are some indicators like that that you may think about a few times before including. You still may include it, and some countries include immunization in their MPI, because they can still see the censored headcount ratio, they can still uh, visibilize progress. But um, it's good to be aware of, of that. And yesterday we talked about subjective data and the difficulty sometimes in interpreting trends over time. Another difficulty that I didn't mention is if your measure is at the household level, but you have the self-reported health status of one member or satisfaction with quality of life of one member, then you're using that member's subjective data to represent all of their household members. And that also may be less accurate. Also, subjective data often do not cover the past year. They have a shorter reference period. So these are some of the considerations that are non-technical, not all of which are directly ethical, but they have to do with the selection of indicators. When you come to your methodological report, then you will justify each indicator. And again, we have examples of how to do this. In fact, during this summer school, we are working on a handbook that will include a sample methodological document you can cut and paste from. Um, <laughs> uh, and, but our suggestion will be that you justify each indicator. And so I've given a sample justification here. So if you have 10 indicators, each one will have a paragraph justifying it. 
Any questions on indicators? So I'll move on to the deprivation thresholds or cutoffs, which is the vector of Z uh, values that we use to identify whose achievements are deprived. So to move from the achievement matrix that James Foster presented to the deprivation matrix, we apply those cutoffs. Um, and they identify the minimum level of achievement. They are strict. So if you are strictly below the deprivation cutoff, you're deprived. If your achievement equals the deprivation, you're not deprived. Don't get confused. For K, the poverty cutoff, it's weak. It's interesting that Bergignon and Chakravarti, in their signal paper of 2003 that I mentioned yesterday, said that the use of deprivation cutoffs for each dimension is the characteristic of multidimensional poverty measures that reflect the joint distribution. Each dimension is important. So we identify deprivation in each dimension. We don't add them up and set a cutoff across them. But where you select the deprivation cutoffs matters. It may matter more than the selection of the poverty cutoff, empirically. Because look, think of a poverty distribution, a CDF of, of income, and where you set the poverty line. And we know that usually there's a bulge. So usually things are quite sensitive to the poverty line. And the deprivation cutoffs are the equivalent in multidimensional space. And so when you do sensitivity tests, sometimes the sensitivity is greater to where you set the cutoffs. So how do you set them? First of all, you look at the purpose of the exercise. For example, in Colombia, the purpose was to make a measure that matched their national development plan. Very conveniently, and if any of you are writing development plans, I would request this, their development plan set targets for each of the 15 indicators. And so the deprivation cutoff was the target, because the government wanted all people to have this level of education, this grade of work, and so on. So if the purpose is linked to the plan, if the plan has targets, you can use them off the, off the shelf, as it were. You can also use participatory work. How much is enough? What do you need not to be poor? And this information does come out quite nicely. There may be legal requirements. Maybe schooling is compulsory up to a certain age, so you use that. Maybe it was compulsory up to a different age for your mother or your grandmother. So you may have different deprivation cutoffs for different cohorts. In Mexico, for example, um, before 1981, there was a different uh, requirement of compulsory schooling. And so Mexico's national measure says, well, for children born from this year, this is our required schooling. For those born in this bracket, it's fewer years. And you may also want to look at the data. Um, if there are some categories that have very low responses, that's good to know. A very important consideration that I don't think we'll have time to present adequately, but I mentioned also yesterday, was that it may be an idea to set two vectors of cutoffs. One for destitution or extreme poverty, and one for moderate poverty. Or one for moderate poverty, and one for the middle class. And so you have, as we said yesterday, adequate sanitation and a flush toilet. Um, you have completing primary school, completing secondary school. So you have different cutoffs, and it's quite interesting to then use the measures together. And Schumann Schett and I have um, a paper on the destitution indicators with Adriano with empirical results, and we'll be working on a, a further paper with empirical results on destitution. But in theory, we have identified how you use rigorously two linked measures with the same indicators, but different deprivation cutoffs. I'm just going to take a break and show you a few pictures of uh, some case studies. I must say to the OFI team, I didn't manage in lunch to put the El Salvador um, video on my memory stick. So if anybody has it, or if it's easy to put it on the memory stick, we could also watch the seven-minute video. But um, I, I couldn't do that. Um, 
So what I will show is um, some field studies from the creation of Bhutan's national MPI. Um, what happened was that in the capital city, in the office of the National Statistics Bureau, we created initially with Anavaj and Maurizio, initially three and later another six draft national MPIs. And then they selected their favorite, having analyzed it, decomposed it, looked at it. And then we drove out into the countryside. Uh, we also walked four hours over a mountain. And I walk fast, but huh. So uh, to some rural communities. Um, and on the first day, we had an open discussion with them about what were the dimensions and indicators of poverty, what were the deprivation cutoffs, what was the importance. That night, we implemented a survey with each of the participants, poor and rich alike, and we sat up and analyzed it. So we got the poverty score of each person and whether or not they would be identified as poor by the candidate national measure. In the morning, we showed them who was poor by the national measure and their, their poverty scores, and they told us why we were wrong. This person's not poor, this person is. You, you know, and it was, it was a very good way of quite quickly getting some feedback. So for example, in Dungna, um, they identified six dimensions of poverty. Um, and then they identified really quite easily um, the cutoffs. And it's interesting that 5,000 nultrum a month is not a lot of money, but 13 years of school is a lot of years of school. So it's fascinating to see the aspirations of this community. It's a community without electricity, without access to the road, without a school, um, except a primary school. Um, uh, but their, their, their cutoffs were quite different across the different topics. And then they were also able to rank them, not to give cardinal weights, but to say which were the most important, land and education, and which were the least important for them. So that was the kind of information we could get from about a two-hour focus group discussion. And then in the morning, we got a lot of feedback uh, on the particulars of the measure and how the indicators were inaccurate in their context or other indicators like disability that we did not consider. Yep. Um, in this, uh, this, uh, method, how many people have you in this decision making? Yeah. So participatory work can have anything from focus groups of eight or ten or twelve people. In this case, it was a rural community, so everybody came. So it was more like 35 or 40. Not everybody spoke, but we tried to make sure that older men, older women, younger men, younger women, people who lived uh, sort of more on the edges and people who were well, well off, everybody had a voice. And the local uh, leaders uh, helped to facilitate that because they knew who was who. In this community, there was not a lot of social strife between the poor and the non-poor. They were quite cohesive. But you have to figure that out, because if there's a lot of tension, then you want to have two groups and have them separate. So this is, obviously this uh, was on sheets of paper because we couldn't draw on the floor. Um, but these were the different dimensions, the different rankings um, that they were making. Last two. Um, I'm over time, aren't I? 15 minutes, OK. I may not quite finish at 3.15, given your interest in weights, not mine. OK, so um, just to review that weights are often called deprivation values, as James Foster explained, because they are applied to a 0, 1 variable, not, as in the HDI, to a cardinal value. And what they do is they reflect the trade-off, the relative impact that the presence or absence of one deprivation has on the person's deprivation score. Um, and for poor people, the impact on poverty. Um, there's also, for those of you who are mathematical, there's an interesting feature that before you apply weights, you cannot compare dimensions. After you apply weights, you have created cardinal comparability across dimensions.
So let's just see if we all agree. In evaluating this summer school, how do you weight expansions in understanding stochastic dominance, understanding the capability approach, completing the paper and state exercises, the friends you'll make, your ability to complete your own doctorate, understanding poverty in China, your future earning potential, or your happiness. So whose favorite, whose biggest value is on understanding stochastic dominance? Oh, come on. <laughs> How about understanding the capability approach? A couple people, cool. How about looking forward to the paper and state exercises next week? Others? How about friendship? <laughs> um, finishing your own studies or PhD. <laughs> um, understanding poverty in China? Hands are better than nods. Um, your future earning potential? It was fascinating. Yesterday I was at Peking University and I gave a seminar. And then there was questions. And then my host, the professor, gave a little discourse to the students. And it was fascinating. He said, not many people in our university work on poverty, but there are a lot of jobs in poverty, and it's easier to get research grants on poverty. So you should go to poverty because you'll get promoted faster. <laughs> Great. How about your satisfaction with life as a whole? Hey, I'm happy. OK, so what I saw was that different people raised their hands for different ones. And if I ask this tomorrow, how many of you might change? I would change. My values change, right? So uh, I do this, it's silly, but I do it just to make the point that our weights, our values are personal, and they're different from each other, and they change over time. And that makes the task that we have of setting fixed weights on aspects of poverty very difficult. Because if we were a group of poor people, their weights would be different. They would change over time. Um, and they would disagree. So how do we go, go ahead? It seems an insoluble problem. And I know that many of you are deeply worried about it. You're not alone. When we worked with our first government, all of the coffee conversations were about weights. Every time we had a coffee, they'd say, how are we going to do the weights? And in the end, and I, have, I think I have the slides here if you're interested, they axiomatically justified the weights in Mexico. It was fascinating, and it wasn't a problem ever again. Human rights are equally weighted, and they wanted a balance between economic and social deprivations, so income and the six social rights were equally weighted. And there was no further anxiety. But getting to that process took a while. So first of all, following Amartya Sen, but also following this trend towards open data, towards transparency, towards dialogue, um, we suggest that the weights be clearly stated and explained in your methodological report and in your presentation. Because Amartya argues that any weights should be subject to questioning. And um, so that we have to, in a sense, not keep the weights implicit but make them explicit, as we do in the MPI, um, always putting the weights, explaining the weights. Um, and that way, if people deeply disagree with us, they can publish it in the newspaper. And maybe the next time the measure is revised, after 10 years, different weights will be assigned. So in practice, when we launched the MPI in 2010, the global MPI, there was a huge kerfuffle, kerfuffle, it's the technical word for kerfuffle. Um, there was a huge problem and debate about the weights. Um, and the concern was that they could not be set in a defensible way. And also that having weights undermined the legitimacy of the measure. So Martin Revalian's first blog on Duncan Green's website, for example, raised serious concerns about the weight on infant, mor infant mortality, on, on losing a child. And also others wrote in and said they would like to use PCA, um, some statistical ways, um, some mechanical way of setting weights, and not try to make value judgments. I think since 2005 to the present, a lot of things have clarified. 
OFI, first of all, published um, robustness tests to weights after that um, interchange um, so that we could show precisely how the global MPI responded to weights. We've done that most years. We should do it every year. I think it's, it's, it's a core element of what should be in a report. And certainly in a national MPI report, there should be a robustness test on weights. Um, but what should that robustness test be? We might not disagree completely in this classroom. Poor communities might not disagree completely. They may not want a zero weight on malnutrition. They may not know if it should be 10% or 40%. But it shouldn't be zero and it shouldn't be 100%. So what we want to find is a range of weights that people can live with, um, that, that come up a lot. And so, for example, in the first robustness test, we looked at the literature on the Human Development Index, where there had been work on its weights, including asking experts what they thought the weights should be. And so we did the robustness test to that range, which was between a quarter and a half per dimension. I mean, you might be able to get away with setting a boundary that seems sensible um, if you don't have other sources of information. Two technical points. Weights are also a function of the deprivation cutoff. If there's an indicator like cooking fuel in which 90% of people are deprived, and an indicator like immunization in which 1% of people are deprived, then the effective weight, the contribution of cooking fuel on over po overall poverty will be higher. So sometimes, in some contexts, you need to readjust the weights. Um, to take into account the fact that your data may not allow you to distinguish between um, relative levels of deprivation that you might wish to. And weights will also be associated by, influenced by the association redundancy among indicators. If you have two that are, that are exactly the same that always appear together, in effect you're doubling the weight on that topic. So how do you set them? It's fascinating for us. Um, in the global MPI, we set what we call, James Foster calls, nested weights. Equal weights across dimensions and equal weights across indicators. And I thought that that was very mechanical and that others would do it quite differently. But actually, if you look at the national measures, I think all but one use equal weights or nested weights um, at those that have been implemented to date. So it's definitely something to think about. Think about how you'll categorize the indicators and dimensions. Think about the weighting structure that makes sense. Test various ones. But because that is so widely used, the most important thing for you to understand is that equal weights are value judgments. And particularly if you are categorizing different indicators into a dimension. So for example, I have one measure in which there are two indicators, body mass index and years of schooling, and they're equally weighted. So what is the weight on health? What's the weight on BMI? 50%, yeah. Now you have a measure with four equally weighted indicators, BMI, years of schooling, caloric intake, and anemia. What's the weight on BMI? One fourth. What's the weight on health versus education? In the first measure, it's 50-50. How about in the second? 75-25. There are three health indicators and one education indicator. So um, you have to think about how you categorize indicators. And it's very common in statistical offices as you're designing measures to actually implement measures with the same indicators, but different weights, different dimensional definitions to try to understand what structure will be most sensible. So this is why I say the weights, the dimensions, and the indicators are iterative. And you keep going back and forth between them to get a measure that seems more accurate. We've talked of using participatory work for um, setting weights. And so I thought it was important also to clarify what weights should reflect 
there would be an argument that if I'm setting up a national poverty measure, which will last across time, the weights should reflect the importance of the dimension. So um, health and education might be equally weighted um, because they're both relatively equal in importance. But if you go to a poor community and everybody has education, there's a great school, a charismatic teacher, um, the children can't wait to go and they love their uniforms, where does that happen? Um, then education might be great, but they may have very poor health outcomes. So when they create a weighting structure, education may have a low weight and health may have a light, high weight. And that's an example of a priority weight. It's not that they don't value education, it's that at this moment, it's not what they need. And so you, in interpreting participatory exercises, you have to think about what weights they are presenting to you and ask them to understand if they are the same as the weights you're trying to set. So, here is uh, one of the many times that Sen discusses weights. And if you read his corpus, which I have done, um, you see he discusses weights in almost every book, in almost every paper. It's a standard feature of his presentation of the capability approach and of measurement. Um, and so here he's asking how weights should be selected. And he says, we have to think about it. In the end, we have to reason and try to think which one is more important um, relative to the others. And he says, for a person, like for Donna Thompson and her family, selecting weights will require our own reflection. But when we create an MPI or an HDI, um, there has to be a kind of reasoned consensus on at least a range of weights. And again, he emphasizes the need for public discussion and democratic understanding. So for the need for us to make our weights explicit in case people have strong views about them. So if you don't use weights, then what do you do? Equal weights or nested weights? How can you, what are the other alternatives? Um, it seems very difficult because you have to bell the cat. You're a mouse, you're trying to get the weights, but you are an economist, you're a statistician, you don't feel qualified to make the final judgment of what they should be. So first of all, you can look at the ranks that come from focus group discussions, but ranks are ordinal. You need to fix cardinal weights. So it's not a perfect answer. You'll still have to make a judgment. You'll also have to ask about the quality of the participatory work. There is, and I'd love to hear more from the folks from Stats SA, um, but there are various survey instruments which have been used also to set weights in Britain, in South Africa, in other places. So for example, in South Africa, there was a questionnaire on socially perceived necessities, which asked, is this item essential for everyone to have in order to enjoy an acceptable standard of living in South Africa today? And people said yes or no. And the list came from a separate process um, so that they identified what were the items that they thought should be on it. And they use as the weights in an index, not an MPI, but an index of deprivation that preceded the MPI, the percentage of people who said yes. So 92% thought that having electricity was essential, 91 somebody to look at after you if you were ill, 82 separate bedrooms for adults and children. So in this sense, you don't have equal weights. You have quite, quite subtle weights but you can explain to policymakers it's what the people said in the survey. And I understand that South Africa has recently finished a community survey and explored the weights that come out on different domains. So maybe later in the course we can hear more about that. One of the difficulties with this particular exercise that I'm referring to is that how long are those weights valid for? Do you redo that questionnaire every year and change the weights every year? Or do you keep them fixed for 10 years but then would people still agree with them? So these are questions, there's no perfect answer. Um, here's another way of asking questions. 
So um, the other thing to do is in the methodological report in your presentation, try to justify weights, again, using different sources of information. This is what came up in focus groups. This is what um, came up um, in terms of previous measures. And this is the robustness of the measure to these different weights. So this may feel very unsatisfactory to you because it's not giving you a clear answer. It's not giving you an equation to solve, um, a static command to run to get the weights. Um, and you will never know if you've done it perfectly. I th and I think that's very important. I don't know if you ever did cost-benefit analysis, but the World Bank tried to implement cost-benefit analysis. And it didn't work very well. And 25 years later, they did an evaluation. And they interviewed a lot of people at the World Bank to say, why didn't you implement the cost-benefit analysis? It's a social cost-benefit analysis. And the economists said, we never knew if we sent the discount rate correctly. We didn't know. We didn't feel confident. And so they didn't want to do it. So my suggestion is that you look technically at the robustness tests. And if you get over 80% of the policy relevant comparisons the same, then you have some grounds for confidence in your selection of weights. To close with a quote from Amartya Sen, a choice procedure like the choice of weights that relies on a demographic, democratic search for agreement or consensus can be extremely messy. As we saw ourselves, we don't agree. And many technocrats, that's us, are sufficiently disgusted by its messiness to pine, to hope, to wish for some wonderful formula that would give us ready-made weights that are just right. But no such magic formula exists, since the issue of weighting is one of values and judgments and not some impersonal technology. So that's as much reassurance as we're going to get. Um, but I think in practice, exploring equal weights, nested weights, different categories of indicators, and robustness tests is um, a clear way forward. So I'm over time, um, and I will go very quickly by poverty cutoff. Um, and it is easier. So the poverty cutoff, as we know, uh, one third for the global MPI, is fixed across the deprivation scores. And if your deprivation score is equal to or greater than the poverty cutoff, you are poor. How is it set in practice for national MPIs or other exercises? I'm just going to give you the answers. I don't have time to discuss them. One is you have an income poverty measure. You want to make a multidimensional poverty measure, but you're nervous. So you want the headcount ratio of the MPI to match the headcount ratio of your poverty measure. That was done in Bhutan. They had a poverty rate of 26%. They said, let's make an MPI, but please, could its headcount ratio be 26%? <laughs> so you make one that's 26%. Obviously, you implement these robustness tests. And the good news about the poverty cutoff is nearly always the results are robust. I actually don't understand why. I need to understand it better. But empirically, that's the case. A second is, again, to reflect participatory <coughs> assessments. A third is to match a legal definition. In Mexico, the social deprivations were human rights. So you have one of your human rights violated, and you're economically deprived, then you're poor. It was simply a definitional factor. Colombia did something very different, uh, or interesting. They um, had a survey that had income poverty in the same survey. So their first question is, how many deprivations um, they, they're weight sum to D. How many deprivations do people who are non-income poor have? And how many deprivations who people, do people who are income poor have? Let's set the poverty line between that. And they found that, non, that income poor people had 5 or 5.1, 5.2 deprivations, and non-income was 3, 3.2. So they set the poverty line just above 3. And then how about people who said that they perceived or they consider themselves to be poor. How many deprivations did they have? 
and people who said they considered themselves not to be poor. How many did they have? And again, it was about five and about three. So Colombia set their poverty cutoff in between. So they could pretty, be pretty confident that their identification of the poor in multidimensional space was more or less in, con consistent with both subjective poverty and income poverty. Go ahead. Again, sure. people from Colombia, please correct me. No, that's the technique used by Dave Gordon and the Bristol group. Um, they look at clustering and they look at changes in, in the slope of, of the regression plot. We don't do that because, um, first of all, it changes every year. And so you want a poverty cutoff that's consistent or you can't compare measures. And it can change radically in different years. But the second is that, you know, what is poverty even in income space? Poverty is something, it's a poverty line. It's, it's something that you should be able to understand. Um, and you can plot this, but what does it mean? It means the headcount ratio is lower here and higher here. So it just happens that in this distribution there's a bulge there. But does that mean that these people are poor and these people aren't? What if it's at the top of the distribution? You know, it's not necessarily reflecting poverty. So I feel more at ease with these. But you're welcome to plot. You're welcome, in a sense, also to find new and better methods. The last point that I would request is that you set K in a way that you can communicate. So let's pretend that you have five equally weighted indicators. So each of them take the value of 20%. And you want to identify a person as poor if they have at least two deprivations. So think about this for a moment. The people's deprivation scores will be 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. So if you set the poverty cutoff at 21, you would identify everybody with two or more deprivations. Similarly, if you set it at 25 or 33 or 40, all of those will identify exactly the same people as poor. But then you have to think about how you're going to communicate it. And the easiest is what I told you, two out of five. Well, 40% is two out of five. So I mention this because sometimes when people do this exercise on making my first MPI, they use a cutoff of 33% and they might use weights of 20% on every indicator. And then why didn't you use 40%? So having the weighting structure of your indicators and dimensions reflected in the poverty cutoff can be quite useful. Um, it's not always possible if you have variable weights and you have quite a curve in terms of the headcount ratio versus poverty. You might set it somewhere in the middle. But when it's possible, think about how you're going to communicate K when you set the value. Um, if K, the same value, of, uh, various values of K identify the same set of the poor. So that's all. Um, you clearly also do dominance tests for K.